Welcome to the Mycelium Network Podcast, a podcast all about early stage web developers and the mentors and teachers that helped them along the way. Hey, I'm Kita, and welcome to the Mycelium Network Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. It's a pleasure. So let's dive right into it. Um, please tell us more about yourself, your career, and what makes you get up in the morning. Yeah, for sure. So first off, my name is Ankita Kulkarni. Um, I guess I'm gonna just start from my school. So like initially, I like I went to school for computer science. Um, I started my company at over there and that helped local businesses build apps. Um, while doing an internship and trying to pay off my tuition all at the same time, it was really fun. And so after that, I transitioned into a developer, got into leadership very early on in my career, thanks to my founder background. Very early on in my career, made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot, which is fun. Um, and then switched to leadership. Um, and yeah, like in my free time, I love to just explore new places, meet friends, hang out. Um, and have a lot of fun. I, I really believe in having a really good work-life balance because what's the point of working so hard when you're not having fun? And what ma uh, makes me get up in the morning is, I guess, like this drive and passion for something that I've been working on. I think that really excites me even the night before. So even like my morning coffee is really fun and... um something that I'm working on, how it's going to excite people and how it's probably going to help people um, really, you know, pushes me to wake up in the morning. Um, and I feel like that's a really good sign for me as well. Like if your mental health is on track and everything as well, because, you know, you're excited, you are passionate to work on something and things like that. So that's a good check for me too. Yeah. So um, I know that you like pour over coffee. So I guess that's one of the things that gets you up in the morning, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I love making my pour over coffee. Um, I love trying like different beans from different regions. So like I, so far, my favorite has been uh, Colombian coffee. Um, uh. But yeah, just in general, like I have coffee that's like, yeah, like I'm going to have this coffee. It's not going to do the job and get me to work right away. But um, there's this other coffee where it's just like, yes, I need to get this done. So I need to have this coffee and get to work. <laughs> I love my coffee, but it's like the, the whole process is really therapeutic for me. Yeah, for sure. I love it too. I love buying like the beans and then the grind and smelling it while it's grinding and steeping and waiting and timing it and everything. Yeah, it's lovely. I've spoken to a previous guest called uh, Andy Anderson, and he also has like a bit of a Almost call it a love affair with coffee. Have you tried mushroom coffee <laughs> at all? I that wanted to sigmatic? always try it. Uh, I don't. I haven't tried a mushroom coffee before, but I've always wanted to try it. In fact, last night I was taking a look at the specific mushroom coffee that uh -huh. allows you to focus a lot more and helps with you know your um, brain fog and everything too. So. Um, I've been, uh, maybe I might buy that. I forget the name though, but yeah, maybe I was looking into it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't tried it either. Um, but yeah, there's this one brand that's very, very well known called Four Sigmatic and apparently it's, um, uh, it's, it's really good. Um, I'll probably, it's quite expensive. So, you know, you can't like drink it like normal coffee. You have to like once a week yeah, as a treat, yeah. I guess. Um, yeah, I think at some point I might just give it a try. Um, what I was curious about is during your introduction, you mentioned about helping local businesses build apps. Do you mind digging into that a little bit more? That sounds really interesting. Yeah, for sure. So um, when I was in school, I really wanted to, um, I cared a lot about local businesses in general, like um, just like trying to help out people as much as possible. I guess like that's a common theme for me and one of the values I really care for. Um, so when I was, I wanted to try something just like doing contracts or something like that. Um, I just felt like, you know, I guess like the big businesses, they have people to help them, right? Like there are businesses out there already, consulting firms, 
to help the Fortune 500 companies or whatever, even the medium-sized businesses, they kind of get along, like they find their uh, people too. But I guess it's the local businesses that it's really hard to find, uh, you know, good developers or people who they can trust and build a relationship with because that's what they care about the most. So that's how I started. I started like, um, you know, trying to find businesses to help like locally. Um, and then, yeah, just like helped a company that helps with like uh, park reservation website and whatnot. So then I help a specific person automate their entire flow. So yeah, things like that were pretty cool. And it really helped a lot. Uh, it, I guess like in a way it also helped me a lot just because I was able to pay off my tuition. And when I graduated, I was like, whoa, no, no student loans at all. So that was really fun. Yeah, that is pretty amazing. There's not a lot of people that can say that. <laughs> if they've finished and their student loans are paid off, that is that is a big <laughs> achievement. Yeah, for sure. Like, I really love, um, I still love, but like really loved at the time, like participating in different hackathons and building products and act like making a difference in the world is something that I truly cared about and even like still do. Um, so that was one one of the ways where I'm like, I want to talk to like customers. I really want to talk to people and see what their problems are and see how uh, they work and what makes them dig and how can I help. Um, although when you are working, um, I also was doing, I was, you know, I was doing this over weekends and evenings and whatnot. I also had an internship. So it's, it's kind of like I was doing a lot. So that also mm -hmm. leads to burnout, which I learned yeah. very early on in my career. So I decided to go back to um, IBM as a full-time developer after, because I, I interned at IBM too, um, because I was like, I'm burned out with, health, with running my business. And I, I was wearing a lot of different hats too. So I was a founder, I was a marketing person, I was a customer support. I learned about setting healthy boundaries because, you know, calls can come at any point. So you need to communicate that. So I learned a lot of leadership skills the hard way, very early on in my career, which was really fun. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. And uh, I also have a pretty big passion about supporting local businesses. Um, it's something we can talk about after the podcast, I think. <laughs> but yeah, you have I have. Yeah. Yeah, you've, you've, um, you've mentioned a couple of times the topic of leadership. And I know it's something that you mm -hmm. have a lot of experience with and that you, you talk quite a lot about. So, what do you think? What does it mean to be a good leader? That's a really good question. Um, so yeah, like for sure, I think because I uh, dab like dabbled into leadership and just like started, um, you know, being a leader very early on in my career, right? Like I mentioned, being a founder and even as a developer, I started leading projects and then started traveling for leading projects across like in London and California, New York, and so on too. So it was it was a really good experience for me. But like to answer your question, what makes a good leader? Um, it's it's a it's not just one thing that I can pick and be like, yes, that's a good leader, right? It's like leadership can be very tricky and hard, and it's, there's no like one real answer. Um, so it's like a leader is someone who like enables you to you know get to the answer yourself. Versus just like telling you what to do, right? Because that's, and I talk a lot about this um, in the course that I'm working on right now, but like maybe we can talk about that later. But it's the concept of leader versus boss, whereas like leader creates that light bulb moments, right? Like it will, they will help you design plans for yourself. They will, you will, th they will make you think and like ask questions to help, you know, um, just like, think more on your ideas, right? So like, and a leader would create more leaders versus like a boss can create fear, anxiety, stress. And I I love talking about psychological safety too. And I think a leader does in enable that, right? Versus maybe a boss, right? Where you don't feel safe to make mistakes. And I think in tech, it's really important that there is a really, uh, a safe space in your team for you to make mistakes because when you make mistakes, you're going to learn faster. You know, it's just like, if you make a mistake again, then let's try to figure out, okay, 
Is there something broken in our process? Why is this happening again? Right? Like things like that. It's, so I feel like a leader really enables and brings out those good qualities as well. Sometimes a leader's job is to just listen and like ask questions. In fact, a lot of times it's that, right? Or like ask a question in a specific pain point so that you can think and get to the answer yourself, right? So it creates that really good domino effect because then the person feels more empowered to make those decisions and will come to you to, for help too. So again, it's just like leadership is quite complex, right? Like I said, it is no like one real answer because everyone learns differently, grows differently and so on. So you need to kind of like balance it out. But yeah, I would say like maybe that in a nutshell would be a good leader. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Um, I love the idea of uh, and I, I applied as well. Like I, I recently, um, I'm at the moment. I'm still, I'm onboarding a junior dev um, at my company, and that is something that I've learned from a colleague I worked with um, at one of the clients that I still work at. But um, he's unfortunately no longer there. But it's one of the things I learned from him is what he did with me is that whole thing where you you leave little breadcrumbs that they can follow, but you don't give them the answer. He would say, hmm, have you looked at the class name that you used there and how you try and get that element with JavaScript? Maybe there's something there that's a little funky. You won't just go out and say, hey, man, you're being stupid. You misspelled the word in the one place. Don't do that. That that doesn't help anybody. You guide them to just, just yeah. double check your how you've named that thing and then they'll see, ah, oh, because that's something we all do, yeah. right? We all mistype a variable name. All of us do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like, um, just like you said, right? Like you ask a question, but if you just tell them, you they are more they are it's more likely that they're going to make that same mistake again, right? They are not going to remember because you told them, and they are, next time they'll probably wait for you to tell them too. Not because they want to wait; it's just that's human behavior, right? Yep. Like that's how we have trained them to behave because of our actions, right? So um, it's like, I, I again, like leadership is also all about maintaining and like building good habits in people too. So it's like, yeah, like if I ask them questions, they're building that thinking habit, right? So that they can come to those answers themselves. And next time, again, they're stuck, that trigger it triggers, right? And it's, they're going to get to the answer themselves. Yeah, I agree. So you mentioned psychological safety, um, and that's another topic that I'm very passionate about: uh, mental well-being, um, being feeling safe, feeling valued, feeling that you can make mistakes, as you mentioned, um, feeling that you can speak up and not have to fear retaliation. Um, do you want to dig into it a little bit? Uh, what you like, if you mentioned the phrase. Um, psychological safety what does that mean for you yeah for sure um so i would say like mean not in any industry right but like being in tech specifically we are surrounded by a lot of different tools and technologies and we are learning a lot right all the time so as humans as developers as leaders we are bound to make mistakes and if we fear that there's going to be a consequence for every mistake, then we are not going to feel safe making those mistakes, right? That means we are going to hide things from people just so that, and the imposter syndrome is probably going to kick in there, right? Because we feel that we shouldn't show this to anyone. But on the other hand, if you, you feel psychologically safe in an environment where you it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to ask questions, it's okay to ask for help, um, then you, the the person, the developer that you are training and developing is going to be turned on to into a completely different person altogether, right? Because then sometimes they can ask questions that you might not even think, right? Because you might not know or you might not remember or um, there's, there's a word for it that I'm forgetting, but just like, you know, the... It's, it's kind of like a curse, right, for us, like when we know a lot. Um, and it's just something that maybe more entry-level developers could point out that we might not even do that, right? 
In fact, even when I was very early on in my career, um, I f- thought that I had a lot of good ideas. And when other people validated that too, that, hey, yeah, she does have a lot of good ideas. I was able to point out creative ways of achieving the same problem without having maybe the experience to back up, right? Because I had different ideas that we would go and try. So again, and I was able to do that because I felt psychologically safe to propose ideas, to ask questions, right? So it's extremely important for um, every team member, not just a leader, every team member to create the psychological safety for each other and not make anyone feel ashamed about asking questions or anything like that. Yeah, that's wonderful. We definitely need more of that, that's for sure. Um, continue on the on the theme of leadership. You have a ebook called The Engineering Leaders Playbook, the first ninety days. And then you also have a yeah. week long free course. So what does the book and the course cover? And like what do you hope lead, uh, people that take this will get out of it? Like maybe what do you get out of the seven week course? And then what additional things would you get if you then also get the, the book? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So one thing I missed out on my introduction, which is a very important part, that I am an educator now. Uh, I built a course um, last year that was pretty successful, so I decided to go full-time on it and really teach. So one of the things that um, I created, like a digital product that I created, was the Engineering Leaders Playbook. And to answer your question about, I have an ebook, but I also have a week-long course as well, right? Which is a free course, right? So what's the difference? So I, as an educator, I truly believe that 90% of the knowledge should be free and accessible to everyone. Because I think that whenever I'm trying to teach something, I'm not perfect in the beginning, right? I, I don't, maybe you don't, you don't know me. I need to still build that trust so that you think of me as a well-known, reputed educator, right? For for then, uh, so then you can buy something from me later down the road, right? But for me, I do think that education should be available freely as much as possible. But I do understand that we do have to pay bills, right? So we do need to, uh, you know, sell premium products as well later on. So the free one-week course was what created for that reason, that it's actually a video course for... Um, it lasts around a week, right? And every every day I touch on a topic and in a video which lasts about five to ten minutes long. So that anyone who's curious about leadership, anyone, any developer who is interested in being an engineering leader and what it means to set up your first 90 days for success in a team or in an engineering team, that that course talks about that. But in the ebook, I elaborate a lot more because, again, I did not want to create really long videos because people's attention span is low. Um, so I, you know, elaborate a lot more in the ebook. Plus, you also get like unlimited updates to the to the ebook and everything too. Plus, um, you get free resources or template libraries that I have created as well that I recently shared with the ebook people who bought the ebook generally. But the overall, like this book is the first 90 days uh, to talk about a little bit, like the reason why I created this specific ebook or course was that, again, like going back to my founder journey all the way to now, right? One thing that I experienced was that whenever you join a new, new team, you need to really make sure that you are not just going through the onboarding sessions and like pretty much like relaxed relaxing there right you are in a new team so you need to take specific actions to build trust early to work on specific tasks to look uh, to you know to, to be eager in general too because that's going to set up the rest of your developer leadership journey and as a leader it's even more important because you are the leader of the team right so you need to build trust with several people people who report into you as well as stakeholders as well as other cross uh you know, cross teams as well, like where you are collaborating. So again, like the first 90 days really uh, covers all of that in general, right? And as my, as, as I led so many teams over the years, I found that there was a common pattern for every time I led a team, I did a specific list of things. So I kind of like 
created a video course to describe it and then elaborated a lot more in the ebook to showcase to you like what it means to be successful. What are some things that you can try to set up your first 90 days for success? Um, so that is as it relates to a leader. Um, what do you think are some good things that a new engineer, like an early stage developer, right, joining a company, what are some good tips you can have for them that they should do in like that third, first 30 days, let's say the first 30 days? What is, What do you think are some good things that people should do that people don't think? Because one of the things that I've always thought important, and it's what they, what they would probably term as soft skills, is to set up short little coffee chats with your new colleagues um, but not just your peers, but also people above you. And that's the scary one, is going to a a manager or a manager's manager and saying, hey, can I have like a 20-minute chat with you? Um, as, an, as an early stage person, you might be a little f- fearful. But the thing is, is, the sooner you build that relationship, the better, I think. Yeah. And I completely agree with you. I think that booking coffee chats would be something that I would recommend as well. Because again, like you are like the label, right? It's a coffee chat. So it's an open conversation to get to know each other. So it it sets a casual tone to the conversation, right? You don't have, you don't need to have a specific agenda. So that will help with the fear and anxiety and stress to like maybe, um, you know, talk to a person, maybe a senior manager or a director or whoever se- is senior to the company, right? But I would definitely recommend to book coffee chats. But other than that, I would say that I think perspective is really important here, right? So if you think about it, like when as a developer, when you join that specific team, it's not just the manager who has hired you, right? It's all, There are more people involved uh, than that. It's not just a manager. It's probably the senior manager and director of maybe the department or something who knows that you are being hired, right? So they care about you and that's why they hired you. Probably they even interviewed you. So maybe a good conversation could be that, you know, maybe say that, hey, we, you interviewed me. I would love to get to know you. How about we book a coffee chat? There's no real agenda. It's just that I would love to get to know you as we would work together. The minute you do that, you are going to build that trust right away. In a, in a, even though you haven't delivered at the, maybe, maybe in the moment at at the time, but it's important that you do that because then when you are in the same meetings, right in the future, you suddenly feel a lot more safe. You feel like you know these people. You have talked to. You have built that common. You have that shared understanding, right? So, I would say that yes, it can be scary, but like maybe try to reach out propose a time and see if that works. Maybe only make it for 15 minutes and see how it goes before making it like a 30-minute conversation, right? And again, like you, you're you getting to know them. So I think that would really help. Um, there is a list of really good questions, like a, like a, uh, on, if you, even if you like Google, like a list of good questions to ask, right? There are, there's a popular blog post that comes up that you can maybe like use to ask questions to if you don't have topics to talk about. So again, like prepare yourself so that you can ease the nerves a little bit too. But I would totally agree with you. That's important. Yeah, great advice. We link it up in the in the show notes um, where people can find these, these sure, questions. Yeah. yeah. So um, obviously... And except in very rare cases, um, you're going to work on a team. So you're going to work with other people. And even if it's only one other person. Um, and one of the things that us as developers have become used to, it's just how we work these days, is this idea of pull requests. So this is you've had an issue assigned to yourself. Um, you've created a branch, you've done some work, and now you're ready to ask your peers like, okay, cool, why do you think? about my work now um whether you're working in the open or whether you're working inside a closed company that's that's a kind of scary moment right especially early days again it can be especially a scary moment because now you have to ask other people what do you think of the code i wrote um so again that imposter syndrome kicks in really badly at that point so now 
what do you think? How do we humanize this pull request process better? And I think from both sides. So as the person opening the pull request, but then also the person reviewing that pull request, how do we make this experience not something you dread, but something you actually kind of look forward to? Because it's a collaborative experience. For sure, yeah. I think that code review is one of the most important part of a developer's day, right? Like anytime you pick up a feature or a bug or anything you're working on, it is not just your code that is going to be reviewed. It's everyone's codes. I think that uh, one thing to really keep in mind here is that it's not your code or my code, right? It's like our code. And it's a common shared code base that we are all collaborating on. So I think having that sort of understanding and is really important from the get-go. But I would say like a code review can be maybe divided into uh, three different steps for, for a person who is, you know, creating a build request, right? So for example, when you do work on a feature or a bug, what I really recommend to a lot of my students actually, and even the people who are mentoring, is maybe create a checklist of things that you know you you should look out for before you put up that code for pull request. So you can give it your best shot and start reviewing your code. GitHub allows you to do that where you can see, or even GitLab, right? Whichever tool you're using. Um, you, you can see the files change and then start to review it as a third person, right? Like how, how would a third person review it? And then start to like make a checklist of things that you would do differently, right? Even like before, go through your past PRs and like past pull requests and see um, what are some common comments that you're getting as well and start adding to that checklist and build this checklist. Now, when you are submitting a pull request, make sure you address them all, right? And try to do the best of your ability. Obviously, they're going to be, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. That's totally cool. Uh, but then, and then submit a specific pull request accordingly uh, submit the template to give a proper description for what you're doing. Again, you want to make the process as easy as possible when you're submitting a pull request, right? Because then the re the receiving end, like the person who's reviewing the pull request, you're making their life easier. And the cycle time for getting a PR approved is going to reduce because of that, right? So again, like when you make a pull request, make sure you do these things. Uh, but when you're like, reviewing a pull request, what's important, and again, this is important for both sides, is make sure that you know that they are humans, right? Um, so they are going to make mistakes. You should ask questions rather than command, right? And I talk about this in a blog post I wrote for humanizing pull requests, uh, is that don't just make statements like just do this or uh, this is not how it's done or anything like that, right? Because those statements are not fun. They don't create the psychological safety that we talked about, but instead ask them questions and be in that uh, learner's mindset too, right? Help the other person get into the learner's mindset that, okay, yeah, like, have you thought about this? Did, did you intend to do this or things like that? And I think that will really help you a lot because again, like on both sides, right? When you're reviewing, you are going to come across a lot more senior because you are asking questions and you're training other developers, right? Who are putting up the pull request. And when you're addressing the comments, right? You're also being receptive to that feedback too. But again, like no feedback is personal. And I think that's important to know that it's not like people are against you. They are just, we are reviewing the code that's going to go into a shared code base. So it's our code. So let's make sure that it's, in the best code, it has the best code quality practices uh, possible so that, you know, it's a, overall a really good experience. But code review, I totally agree that it's definitely, it can be a stressful experience if the tone is not communicated accurately. And one of the things that I mentioned in my blog post, um, and I also have a talk on YouTube about the same, which is that use emojis, especially in the remote world now, right? It's hard to like interpret the tone of uh, someone and some people can be a bit dry. Some people can be, you know, really expressive. So it's not probably maybe going to translate in a, in a message, 
or in a comment, right, when you're code reviewing. So maybe like add emojis, add exclamation marks, things like that, that will help, you know, convey that message would like really help you. And again, like writing as a developer is so important in this case, like improve your writing skills too, because again, you might not have all, you might not know all the words that you should use in a code review to make it an inclusive environment, right? But if you keep practicing your writing a bit, then I think that helps too. I Honestly, I can talk about this topic all day because code reviews is something that should be an iterative process in every team and something that doesn't work. Let, so figure out if several people are making that mistake or some people are missing things, then maybe there's a process that needs to be created or something that needs to be automated, right? Because it's not, if, if, if multiple people are making the same mistake or is missing something, it doesn't mean that it's their problem. It's probably something is, something needs to be automated there, right? So maybe like a rule that we need to add in the code base or something like that. So again, I would say like that would really help as a starter to make the code review process better. Yeah, agreed. That's good advice. That's really good advice. Um, yeah, because it, it can be. I mean, I've seen that there's a study that's, that's been out. I, I've got the PDF of the the outcome of the study. I haven't digged into it deeply, mm -hmm. but it is a problem, like especially in open source. And I think it's, I personally find it sometimes hard to just communicate with text only um, because sometimes you tend to, I don't know, you read your own emotions you put your emotions on the other person's words. And so, you know, you interpret it from your perspective and you're not necessarily always thinking, well, who wrote that? What is their way of communicating? And that's especially hard if it's not something you work with, right? So if you open a pull request against like some open source project, you've never met this person. You've never spoken them into in real life. So you don't know when they say something in a specific manner, if that comes from a place of being... I don't know, like you say, dry or just stringent or short or whatever the case may be. Um, because you just don't know that person. Yeah. And so now you only have a string mm -hmm. of text that you try have to try and put meaning, pull meaning out of. So yeah, I think it is important to use like all the tools we have available to us when we when we do communicate like this. Mm -hmm, for sure. And I guess like if you are a new developer joining a completely new team, Again, like like you mentioned earlier, like booking those coffee chats, building that trust initially, um, you know, all that is really important before you put up that pull, pull request, you know, because um, uh -huh. you might misinterpret the, and the, uh, the tone of the person or the other person might do the same, right? And I think when like you, certain, certain times you just know this person means well and like that's how they talk, right? And they don't realize it. Yeah, you can make them aware, but sometimes you also have that mutual understanding that really helps too with code reviews. So like build that as well before you put up a pull request in a new team, because that would really help you, um, yeah, with doing code reviews in general. So as an educator, um, and I mean, to be fully honest, I'm also an educator and um, doing more and more in that, that space. I also passionate about community, so I do a bunch of community management, especially for open source projects. Um, but as an educator, what advice do you have for other educators? Maybe especially seeing um, that the audience of this podcast is generally more early stage developers. Um, what advice do you okay. have for educators working with early stage developers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would say that truly break down the complex topics into chunks that are digestible for people. Um, and I think one thing that I really um, like about the, you know, my teaching in general, right, and what I've, the feedback that I've heard from other students as well, is that you don't want to just teach them, give them the answers and show them this is how you resolve the errors. You want to share why those errors happen to begin with, right? Because as a developer, you are going to come across a million errors, right? And if you were to told every time how to resolve it, then it's not going to create that light bulb moment, right? So 
explaining why certain things are done and how you would do it. So like I also show when do you find that answer, right? Like how did you go to the docs and how do you search documentation and navigate around it? I think that is also important. So my advice would be to truly, um, you know, think from a beginner's mindset and like trying to figure out what and, you know, put yourself in the student's shoes and try to figure out what are some of the key pieces to um, build the bridge that logic, right? And I think instructional design really helps a lot with that too. Like if you want to teach one specific topic, what are the precursors to it? Like what are some things that people need to know beforehand, right? And write down all the things that even you may think it's basic and maybe like get it reviewed by someone too. Because again, I think I'm forgetting the name again, but it's the course, something curse, which is like when you are, you know a lot, it's going to be a, um, you, you know a lot, right? You, you might not remember everything. So uh, you might miss certain things. So I think it's important to do that and really break down complex topics. The second advice, like I would say is like, uh, I truly believe in this. Like again, and I think visual learning is has become really important now. People remember things when it's like more visual, right? You will remember when you go to um, a, a coffee shop, you will remember the painting on the wall or something, right? Because it's a visual, it's a colorful painting that's sticking out in a coffee store. You are going to remember that and you are going to get drawn to it. Same thing for education too. Like if you have a concept, maybe draw diagrams, maybe draw, maybe teach in a visual way so that people can remember things because I think that also helps. Anything that you can do, to make the learning journey as easy as possible and as fun as possible is going to really help the student for sure. Anything yep. that you would like to add being an educator? No, I agree with that. I think it's great. And I think multimodality is super important. I just listened to a podcast today where, the, where they were talking about this fact that not everybody learns the same and why it's so important to offer the material that you provide in different modalities. Because some people like a physical book because they like the idea of being able to write little notes in the sidebar and um, being able to use a highlighter to highlight things. Um, I guess, you know, online we, we have tools like that now where we can like highlight things. Like if we have it as a PDF, you can highlight stuff and you can see your highlights later on. Um, but then... Some people struggle with stuff like dyslexia, for example. So for them, giving them a book is actually tricky because now they have to sit with this fact that they are struggling to read this material. So for them, being able to listen to it or being able to watch a video, like you said, that makes it more attractive to them and it makes it more accessible to them. And for me, like the term accessibility is something I'm passionate about. And then people ask me, that, but what is it about? Why accessible? Because it's part of everything. It's not. I'm not just talking about a, a big person with a screen reader being able to use your website. I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about the fact that your website loads two megabytes of JavaScript, and that means people in developing countries not being able to access your website because they are on um, low end devices with slow slowish internet and uh data caps so for them it's like Ugh, i just wanted to watch this website and now all my data is gone um and accessibility plays a role here again in how you educate um i'm not saying every person necessarily have the time or the means to make their content available in every medium but that's why it's also great that there's so many teachers because, and that's why when people say like, oh, I don't have anything to teach people. It's like, it's not about whether you have something to teach people that nobody else has done. It's about maybe the way you teach is just the way somebody else connects with. So, you know, don't be mm -hmm. scared to teach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that's a really interesting topic too, right? Because again, like I heard it recently from a friend itself, like they were like, I would love to be an educator, but I think everything has already been taught by everyone. And I'm just like, if I were to think that, then I would not be an educator, right? Because I think there's a, I guess like just the creator economy in general is like, I don't know, like a multi-billion dollar industry, right? Just because there are so many students with different learning um, skills, right? Like different ways of grasping information that it's extremely important for 
them to have a teacher or an instructor to teach them, right? Like a lot of times a student, like I recently got feedback on my course on Next.js. Uh, one of the students was like, I learned Next.js through a couple of different t- uh, instructors. But when I learned from you, it it clicked and it made sense, like the data fetching methods in Next.js. And I, I, I was just thinking about that. I'm so glad that this is why there are several more instructors, right? Because not everyone's going to understand everything. People come from different backgrounds. They grew up differently. Um, they're, they're, you know, there's knowledge that different people ha- have, right? So again, people are more visual re- re- learners. Like even like my course on uh, engineering leaders uh, playbook, my course on the ebook, right? People who like different mediums will, can can learn, right? People are who are more book readers can just get the ebook. People who are more, you know, visual learners can just go watch the video course, right? So it's like, it's important that even the same content is in different formats too, so that people can consume better as well. 100% agree. And on that topic, you have a newsletter called Fun in Snacks. And one of the things you do in there is that you use code snippets to teach complex topics visually. Now, of course, we're on a podcast, so it's a little tricky, but if you can take a stab at it maybe and- Um, explain to us, how did you come about this and what do you mean by that? How do you use code snippets to teach a complex topic visually? For sure. I'm going to say that I have two newsletters. One is on a leadership topic and one is front-end snacks. So if if people are more interested in leadership, just check out my website. We'll probably add in the show notes too. But for front-end snacks, yeah, like it's honestly a Writing a newsletter, both of these new de- newsletters are like the highlight of my week because I have a lot of fun sharing knowledge and sharing things in a way that people can understand in less than five minutes, right? Because people don't have a lot of time. And I think the idea with Front End Snacks was that um, what can I, like people are busy, right? Like people have um, their full-time jobs. They have so many things going on. That is extremely important that they also focus on learning and prioritize learning. But you just scan with so much going on. So this newsletter's purpose is to teach you a concept visually so that you can learn in less than five minutes and understand it. So one of the topics, and again, it's a podcast. So I'm going to try my best to explain it. But I think one of the topics that um, was was part of the recent newsletter editions was Promises. So as a JavaScript developer, um, you you work with promises a lot. And for folks that don't know what promises are, essentially, whenever you have to make an API request, you can wrap that specific API request so that, uh, in a promise so that you're getting the promise in three different states. You get like in a fulfilled promise, a rejected promise, or a pending promise. So think of it like an API request can either get you the results you want or don't get you the results you want or it's just like a work in progress because it's working on getting the resources right from the server. In that case, you can show like a little loader or something like that. So Promise's job is that, right? So one of the topics that um, is a bit confusing is a Promise.all versus Promise.all settled. And a Promise.all, so let's say you have a chain of different API calls. So for example, you are fetching Pokemon API and you are fetching API for all the, uh, you know, I don't know, all the dogs, right? Like giving you Pokemon and dogs. Um, and in promise.all, you can it's accept an array of promises. So you can say, yeah, like make these two asynchronous requests, give me, like go, right? Like go fetch the Pokemons, go fetch like the list of dogs as well. And it's going to return um an array as well and then it, it what with the promise at all what happens is it will reject as soon as one of the promises in the array rejects so for example you get the pokemons back but you don't get the list of dogs then promise at all is just going to be like oh didn't get the pokemon you don't get the dogs either right like that's the idea with promise at all but in promise at all settle which is something that i think we should all use more but is not as popular is that it will never reject. It will 
it will basically, um, you know, it will resolve once all promises in the array have either been rejected or resolved. So, for example, in the promise dot all, if we don't get the dogs if the Pokemon rejects, right? But in promise dot all settle, um, it will tell us what has been rejected or resolved and then give us all back. And in an application, it's important that we get um, all the data back, right? Versus like we keep waiting on it forever. So this is like one snippet. I've tried my best to explain it, but maybe we can also add the snippet in the show notes so that people can follow along as I'm talking. <laughs> yeah, we'll link to this uh, specific um, edition of the newsletter and then obviously to the newsletter itself so people can subscribe and learn all these cool things. For sure, yeah. Um, so open source, um, another passion of mine. <laughs> um, in a nah. recent talk uh, by Stormy Peters from GitHub. Uh, she mentioned that by 2030, I believe it was, um, another we need another 1.6 million developers because of the demand that there's going to be. So as an educator again, um, how do you see open source play a role in, in education? I think open source plays a big role in education. Like, I think one of the things I mentioned about even like with my 90 days leaders playbook course, right? Like I want it to be accessible so that we can enable developers, we can educate developers and developers become decision makers in the future of in our tech industry, right? And because of open source, that is possible, right? Because when things are open source, you as a developer can go and share your feedback and like discuss what are the different options that um, that specific framework or library can, you know, can can play a role in, right? So for example, Next.js is a open source framework and a lot of developers have been sharing feedback and making sure that the future of Next.js is good. So... Vercel being one of the um, one of the companies that is heavily invested in Next.js is investing in Next.js in the development of it, right? So that and taking the feedback from community to improve it better. So again, it becomes great for Vercel from a business point point of view, but also for developers, it becomes an easier way to give feedback and whatnot, right? Um, so again, it helps open source definitely plays a huge role in enabling developers to, um, you know, take those specific actions and so on. But it can be, I can, I can, yeah, it can be definitely challenging being a more entry-level developer to contribute to open source. But if you were to Google like open source getting started document, there are a couple of GitHub repos that will show up that will, um, that will show you exactly how you can, what are some beginner open source projects that you can start creating a pull request in and start contributing in. The easiest thing that I have done in the past too, and I think I would recommend is maybe like uh, helping with documentation, right? Like start maybe with the documentation so you feel more empowered to create a pull request, uh, th them getting accepted. Eh. Uh, if the pull request does get accepted, then I think it helps you as well uh, because you're going to gain more confidence that your pull request maybe got accepted in, I don't know, in the React repo or something, right? So again, it's like really helpful as a developer to feel empowered to um, do that too, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I can say that um, a project that is really good for this is MDN Web Docs. Um, contributing to the content of MDN Web Docs is there's a bunch of, Issues specifically highlighted for good first issues or just be, just beyond that. So I think as an on-ramp, that's really good because it, the nice thing about it is it documents the open web. So by contributing to it, you're also learning about HTML, CSS, JavaScript, whatever there is that you have an interest in. Um, and there's always something to do because, you know, the technologies keep moving. So I think that's also a nice place to, to look for if you're – early stage developer or if you're just new to open source i think that is a nice one ramp um for so sure i know you it also helps with their future job prospects too yeah because um yeah. like people are if you're an open source developer 
then you are going to become, you're going to gain visibility from folks that are probably hiring. So I think that also helps too. Sorry, you were saying. No, no, no. That's cool. No, I was going to say, um, on the back on the topic of teaching, I know you're working on a new course. Um, can you tell us a bit more about it? What is it about? And when can people expect to get their hands on it? For sure, yeah. So I have been working on this course for helping and growing developers into engineering managers. Or if you're curious about leadership, or if you are an existing or newer engineering manager with, let's say, two to three years of experience, then this course would be a great, um, you know, great course for you because you are going to learn um, exactly what you need to do to build a high performing team and grow the team. Um, as I'm like, I have gone through, you know, downturn, I have dealt with a lot of different cases and in and dealt with like building a lot of like high performing teams in general too. So how do you grow people? How do you give difficult feedback? How do you enable people? How, what is, what are some qualities in a leader? How not to be a boss? Um, and, what are some things you can do for making sure that um, you're pushing the technical excellence of the team as well? Because now you may not have time to be an individual contributor as much, right? Because you are a engineering manager. So I cover a lot of these things from an engineering perspective. Um, so I've been working on a course, um, although it's not fully ready yet, but I will be making it available in early access um, in a couple of months. But if you are interested, we, I, we, I can definitely send you the link um, to it as well. Um, and if you do, it, I'm, I've started the wait list recently. So if you are interested, I can send you that for sure. So this course is, again, like one of those things where when I was looking to grow into an engineering manager or even a leader, I couldn't find a lot of really good content on specific to, specifically to engineering. Um, and I know now that recently there have been like books and courses and whatnot, but then I wanted to share like some of the mistakes that I've made and the learnings that I've had so that you know exactly what it is like in, like, like in, in real life, how, what it means to lead a team and, uh, what it means to lead a big team and also a, um, a really working in a startup and leading a team as well. So again, like the strategies are different. So yeah, I've been working on this course. I'm really passionate about it. Um, my leadership newsletter does know about it. I've been sharing updates to that. So yeah, if you're interested in checking it out, then sign up to the wait list. Great. Yeah, we'll definitely put that in the show notes. Um, and I will also spread the news. It sounds really good. I know Senator Drasner also released a book last year, I think. That's also on this topic, which is also a really, really good read because she has quite a lot of experience with that, especially while she was at Netlify. Um, so yeah, that's that's good stuff. Looking forward to that. So um, yeah, I, yeah. To add to that, I have read her book and I think it's really great too. And I'm I'm very happy, like we talked about, that there are several educators, there are several people talking about this topic because there is a gap in the market, right? Like there are developers that are potentially they want to get go, grow into leadership but they don't know how right and a lot of a, a lot of developers like we know how to code we know how to be an ic and be an individual contributor because we have a task and we accept we can complete the you can take the definition of done but when you become an engineering manager you're like there's no definition of done how do i how do i do this how do i measure my success like there's nothing on that so i'm glad that there are so many topics right now on that so i'm very happy yeah yeah I, I also think that um one of the things that maybe sometimes people are a little afraid of when they and it's a, on, a, on a lot of fronts education is just one of them um is some people struggle with the scarcity mindset so they're always like i don't want anybody to know about that person or that person or that person's work because they're going to take away my my um students but you know, if you if you don't if you don't suffer from the scarcity mindset and you believe that there's enough for everyone, then you actually would go out of your way to promote another educator to say, "Hey, this person wrote a really great book. I would encourage you to read this." Um, 
But I, there are, it, it is a problem. Like there are people that's really, uh, and maybe it's circumstances like where you grow, grew up. Maybe you've always been told that, you know, you got to guard your resources because there's not enough for everybody. Um, but I'd like to officially say, even as a person living in a third world country, there is enough for everybody to go around. So don't be scared of, don't see other educators as competition. See it as your fellow educators trying to just all teach people something valuable and learn from each other and be be willing to share. Um, I think there's enough for us all. And in the end of the day, it benefits students who will be the next teachers. So, you know, I think that's a healthier approach to it. For sure, yeah. And I don't, and I genuinely believe this, that there's not, you cannot just create one single resource for a topic and that will solve all your answers and all your questions, right? Um, I think that you need to keep learning and keep reading and re different perspectives and experiences in order to even become a better developer or a better leader, right? And I totally agree with your scarcity mindset. I think there's enough for everyone. Like we have, plus there are so many developers um, entering the industry via boot camps and you know now tech has become such an inclusive place that i think that we need more educators now to fill the gaps and teach people um you know diff from their experiences because again like different educators are going to have different experiences and different students are going to get attracted to that so it's important that we all support each other and i truly really believe in the power of a community right so whoever the educators are that i know like, you know, I follow them on Twitter. I check out what they're working on. I, I'm excited to learn from them, you know, because I'm like, how can I, how did they do that? Like, how can, how did they teach this really cool, like topic, in, such a difficult topic in such a cool way? And maybe I, I'm taking notes, right? Like maybe in the future I could, that triggers a thought for me. And, you know, I have a new idea now because I learned from them, right? So I think it's a, it's such an open and inclusive community, um, that I think we should all be, you know, cheering each other up versus like, yeah, yeah, with that scare, you know, living with that scarcity mindset. It's not a healthy mindset to begin with. So yeah, completely agree there. Yeah, I agree. You mentioned an interesting topic, um, inclusivity, and you're saying that you see it as a very inclusive community. Um, I've spoken to some people in the past who don't disagree with that, but they do have they have had or they are having a different experience for you how have you found the tech industry from that perspective from the welcoming inclusivity aspects i mean i would definitely say like every person's experience is completely valid and if you've had that experience then there are, every industry has a gap and I'm pretty sure tech has to um I, in terms of like my experience, I feel like uh, for the most part, I have been very uh, fortunate that I have worked with people that have been really inclusive or if they were not maybe as inclusive, they were open to getting feedback from me, right? Or uh, other peers and looking to improve and changing it, right? So I think that's really important too. So I, I think for me, for the most part, People have been very inclusive. People have been, and I think that's how I was able to, uh, you know, grow faster in a lot of ways too, because, you know, able to like lead a project in my first year of graduating, right? Because I was, you know, I was in that inclusive space where people felt, made me feel more psychologically safe and created that environment for me that I could lead projects and gave me those opportunities, right? But I've definitely had experiences too wherein it probably was not that in inclusive and I did notice it. But after giving that feedback in a fo by focusing on the impact it's having versus the them being the problem really helped because then they, will, they didn't realize it, right? And I, probably I did that too to other people. So it's like important to give each other that feedback to make it um, a more inclusive place. But having said that, I do know that they can be completely um, toxic places or toxic uh, maybe people, you know. And I know toxic is a negative word, but there could be people that that do exist that are like that. And in that case, it should be dealt differently, right? So, um, but yeah, I would say for the majority of the 
Uh, but I, I also feel like a, a lot of times, like recently a friend asked me, right? Like how, like how come you were able to grow so fast or how come, you know, you had these positive experiences in your career. And I also feel like because I put myself out there a lot more too, right? Like I don't mind if I fail. I don't mind looking um, like a person who doesn't know things. I am going to ping people who I think I can learn from because I know they have done an incredible job. I will message them. I will ask them how they got to that point or what did they do because I love to know how they did it so that I can do it too. So I think it's important to like foster that mentality as well, right? So yeah, some 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 tips there, but I do know I don't want to I don't want to ignore what's, you know, what's not working for a lot of people and that it can be toxic and it can be damaging as well. And in that case, probably it's better to look somewhere else, right? Because certain things cannot change, but try with by giving feedback first. Yeah, that's good advice. You also have a YouTube channel. What is your... Yeah, goals with your youtube channel what 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 do you hope what do you what is your goal with it yeah i think your goal what is your goal with your youtube channel yeah so i wanted to again like put myself out there to really showcase um the way i communicate again giving back to the community and like sharing as much knowledge as possible so my goal with the youtube channel is just that like sharing topics, ch- talking about topics that I'm interested in. Um, so far, I have a topic on how you can stand out as a developer, because that is something that I personally felt like not a lot of developers know about it. And I, when I started, when I became a manager or even like a lead, I was, I was surprised to know how many people don't know how to grow and ask for more. So I created a video just, you know, just uh, covering that topic. The other one is more technical, like VS Code tips or Tailwind. So again, like I feel like I sit at the intersection of front-end and leadership, but I'm passionate about front-end, but I'm also passionate about leadership. So I think that a YouTube channel covers that, and I think you're going to see uh, a lot of that content, but the main target audience is developers or developers who are interested in being leaders, career development and whatnot. Yeah, so another way of sharing knowledge as an educator yeah, I really like the one about VS Code tips. I got at least two of them that I was like, hmm, I think I commented on your video about the one that you mentioned that's kind of like uh, yeah. Run.js, but inside VS Code, that's a really cool extension. Yeah, for sure. I also created a short after you commented too, and because a couple of people mentioned, oh, I didn't know about Quaka, And I was like, hmm, interesting. That's very cool. I should probably create a YouTube short. But again, like I think... Um, the more content there is, right, and more fun content like that, I think it's just we are going to learn from each other. So I think YouTube is a great platform for that, and it allows me to teach more people, which is my goal as well, right? Teach more students. So it helps me expand my reach. Yeah, for sure. This was a great conversation. I am so glad we finally got to do it. Um, In closing, I have one question remaining which wasn't on the list. I just came to me now. So sorry for, for jumping <laughs> on, on to you. No, no worries. Um, what, is, what is your definition of success for yourself? That's a very, very, very good question. Um, I would say that my definition of success is not the, like not a goalpost, for example, right? Like I want to reach goal X, if I reach goal X, yeah, I'm successful. I don't think so. My definition of success is how many, how many things have I tried, and am I still striving for excellence? Or if I'm still striving for the things that I'm really deeply passionate about, then that is my definition of success because I am successful and I'm because I'm happier because I'm going after the things I really care about. And I think if you keep doing that, then I think money, success, everything is just going to follow you. And that has always been the case for me. Um, So I think it's important to go after the joy in your life. Sorry, a bit philosophical here, but I think that that is my definition of success. Keep trying, fail fast, iterate, and, you know, move on. 
to something else. Because if something doesn't work, that's totally okay. And I think my YouTube channel was that too. Like I had no idea that I was going to create a YouTube channel even a six months ago. I would have probably like laughed at my friend or something if they suggested me to create a YouTube channel. But I thought I love sharing knowledge. Why not? And YouTube is such a great platform. So to, in my definition, I was successful because I tried something that I never thought I would. And I'm enjoying it. So and people have people like you and other people have shared really good feedback in community, other communities that I'm part of. So, um, yeah, that is my definition of success. That's great. I love that. Yeah. Goalposts. We, we're just going to keep moving the goalposts, right? That's the old adage. Like once you read the goalpost, you just move it again. <laughs> like you're chasing the next goalpost. And I, that's probably a way <laughs> of being the opposite of what you're striving for. That is a way to be unhappy because you never feel yeah. fulfilled. Whereas if you can enjoy what you have in the moment and you can be feel like you're successful because you're still curious and because you're you feel happy about where you are in life, I think that's a much better uh, goalpost to have. Yeah, said goalpost. <laughs> that's so innate. But yeah, I think it's a better goal to have. For sure. And I would definitely add, though, because you mentioned that a lot of listeners are in the early stage, are in their early stage career, though. It can, it can become frustrating where maybe the first goal that you set or the couple of goals you set it's the goal, 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 you're unable to reach that goal, right? Because it's frustrating that you, you're you're just starting out or something. Uh, and it's, again, like focusing on that learning and the joy. You still focus on that. And I'm, I promise you, you will get there because we all did, right? Uh, and something's better for us all the time. So keep trying and keep playing around and keep uh, working on things you're passionate about because you will reach that goal. And I know it can be frustrating for someone like me or us to say that, oh, yeah, like enjoy the journey or something, right? Because we did, uh, we have done a lot of things in the past, right? Which gave us the confidence to invest in ourselves more. But it's also important that the same advice applies even when you're starting out and you're trying things because the more you try things, you know what you like and you're going to figure it out more and more. See, I just want to add that. Yeah, thanks for adding that. Well, thank you, Ankita, for sharing your knowledge. Um, I really appreciate it. And I wish you all of the best for the future with all your endeavors. And um, I'm looking forward to your course. And I'm definitely going to share all the links out uh, to the community because I think there's so much here for everybody to learn. Thank you so much for joining and all of the best. Thank you so much. I just have one little gift for the community if you are interested. I have um, my ebook. I have created a spe special discount code for the ebook. So if you are interested, I will link down below. Um, you get twenty percent off. Like just as a thank you for having me on the on this podcast. It was lovely. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Speak to you soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mycenaean Network podcast. If you're not already. Please subscribe, store, and leave a review for us in your podcatcher of choice. This helps others find us and helps us make a better podcast for you, our listeners. You can also find and follow us on Twitter at Network Mycelium and join the community on Discord. All the links are available in the show notes.